let's get this show on the road. Um, welcome everybody to the first official filtered forum. Um, so rather than this being kind of a didactic lecture, we really want to make this more of a Q&A session, uh, informal chat between me and Mark, but also you guys as well. Um, so feel free to tweet as well about, about the filtered forum, hashtag filtered forum, and we'll do our best to engage with those two. Um, so a brief introduction. Um, I'm Sam Franklin, the head of marketing here at Filtered. And I'm joined here by Mark Zal Sanders, our CEO. Hi, Mark. Hi, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Um, yeah, so as I said, the format will be much more of a Q&A, not a lecture. So feel free to drop questions into the Q&A function in Zoom or into the webinar chat. And we'll keep an eye on both of those. Uh, and I'll drop those questions through to Mark. Um, We'll be recording the webinar as well, um, so we'll send it around afterwards. So no need to take notes or take pictures of your screen if that's what you're into. Um, cool. Uh, and I'm sure most of you have heard of us as Filtered being at the webinar, but we're an edtech company based here in Shoreditch. We're around 30 people. Um, we believe that uh, changing large organizations doesn't have to be as complex as it is. Um, we want to make it simpler. That's what our product Magpie does by using algorithmic learning recommendations um, to drive uh, capabilities that your business cares about. Um, that's what we care about too, right, Mark? That is correct, Sam. Very good summary of um, what we're about. Yeah, like it. <laughs> Thanks. Like I work in marketing or something. Right. Cool. <laughs> so we have a problem, guys. Um, well, actually, if you've got perfect engagement rates and everyone's reading all your content and you've can prove all the ROI, then you can probably just leave this webinar now. And yeah, everyone I'm, stayed. Yeah, everyone stayed. A miracle. Um, so yeah, so far. we have a problem. Why aren't employees coming to corporate learning systems? Or more instructively, perhaps, why would they, Mark? Okay, so that's the first question, isn't it? All right, I'll, um, I'll go on. Well, first of all, I'd, I'd challenge that. Um, I mean, it's, they do come to the learning systems because they have to for compliance. Um, so I guess the qualification of the question would be, a useful qualification would be, um, why don't they come to learning systems um, to, uh, yeah, for elective, non-compulsory, non-mandatory um, learning? And, and I think the reasons for it, um, I mean, first of all, okay, so, so that's a premise, you know, do you accept it or not? We've spoken to many, many clients and, and generally this is a, a huge issue that, that um, penetration rates, usage rates are in low single digits, um, if, if that. And, if you, and, this, and this resonates with um, what I think your, one's um, common sense uh, experience of this would be. If you ask a friend of yours who doesn't work in L&D um, what they think of their corporate learning system, it either, it, in, mo in many cases, it'll either be that um, you're not hugely complimentary or it'll be that they, they don't use it at all, they haven't, they haven't heard of it. Um, of course, for, in our world, it's, you know, it's a huge thing. We talk about it all the time. A lot of us are going to this big show um, next week, Learning Tech. Um, but for many, many people, it's not, it's not like that at all. It doesn't actually um, pierce their consciousness very much in the working day. Um, and the reasons for that are that work is really busy. You've got meetings, you've got email, you've got relaxation, um, time to find. Um, and, and on email in particular, we get 120, 180 emails a day, knowledge workers on average. So that means you've just got a few minutes. You're never free of it. So as soon as you, um, you know, leave this webinar, for example, as soon as I get it, come out of this webinar, there'll be a bunch of emails. So it feels like life, working life is urgent um, and I don't have time to, you know, relax into some elective learning. So, so the point there is it's just so hard to compete with how modern working life is. Um, and that's why we've focused what we're doing on a change program that the business cares about. You need a hook, a really strong reason for the individual and for the um, business. Um, for for someone to to want to learn something um and that could be you know that could be lots of different things leadership could be that the the, the the ceo wants staff to to act more entrepreneurially um take more risks could be data literacy could be digital 
literacy. Frankly, all of these things are useful. Um, but, the, but the point is, if there isn't a, a specific enough reason to learn, then the elective learning doesn't happen very much, or not on your terms, or not in, on terms that you can um, really su support and facilitate. Because bear in mind, the other com com uh, competing factor for um, people's time is just the learning that they're going to be doing anyway. People on social media, um, articles appear from The Economist, from um, Financial Times, uh, Guardian, wh or whatever it is, and, and they'll do some learning there themselves. And it's very, very frictionless. It's very, very natural um, and happens all the time. So that's the other respect in which we're, we're competing with um, that attention. So yeah, we do have a problem and, um, and we think that you know, using every advantage that you possibly can to try and solve it in order to, um, to actually have an impact on, on people is, is essential. Absolutely. Um, yeah, totally agree. And I think that I read a stat that something like 100,000 words a day most people read um, through digital sources, and it just doesn't even feel like that. But I guess in the age where Inbox Zero is kind of a distant dream, if we do have that problem, how are we suggesting that we can make learning more of a priority for people? Like, how can we achieve that? What's that, Sam? 100 words a day? 100,000 words a day people read, supposedly, wow. through, like, you know, online sources, etc. Oh, I was not aware of that. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's a good stat. Um, as, as Mitch was so saying you... as well, he's saying uh, it's not information overload, it's filter failure. I like the, the use of filter in there. Yeah. Yeah, we spent ten thousand dollars on our, our URL uh, many years ago because um, it felt like that was a, an essential part of the problem that we were trying to um, were trying to solve. So yeah, good use of word, Mitchell. So yeah, how are we suggesting then that we can have more of an impact? Well, so I mentioned it briefly: um, the change programs or particular issues that companies are um, looking at trying to change in, you know, in, um, in them. So, so, so probably the, the, we'll get to survey results um, in, in a bit, but one of the very obvious ones that you know, is talked about a huge amount is digital transformation. Digital transformation at a large company obviously includes, involves so many different things, um, you know, infrastructure and culture and, um, and learning capability is one relatively small Parts of that, but a digital transformation project can be um, can cost you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, pounds, euros. So the 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 proportion of it that is to do with capability lifting is still is still significant. So if you can latch on to um, a specific um, goal like improving digital fluency amongst all staff or amongst a subset of staff. Um, one, I think you're likely to get the buy-in from the higher-ups, you know, even from right to the top, the CEO, we'll talk about stakeholder engagement later, but um, that's just more likely if it's, um, if it's part of a stated manifesto from, you know, from high up. And the other reason it's more likely to work is that it's a more focused goal. So rather than like a lot of the, you know, the general purpose learning systems um, will, you know, claim and try to do, which is, you know, solve all learning for all of the people in the company, you're, it's much more likely to succeed if you're saying, okay, really want to focus on these particular, this particular capability. I'm going to break it down in this way and, um, and deliver learning content in various ways to, um, to address that specific need. So, yeah, I think that's quite a fundamental part of um, at least our approach to tackling this difficult problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, trying to align with that business change. And then it's not just the businesses that care about these change, right? It's the individuals because they know they have a vested interest in following what the business values. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. Um, and we actually ran a survey recently in our audience and outside it. Um, one of the questions was, what change programs is your business running or planning to run? Um, I've got the data, uh, but I'd really like to hear first from, from you guys in the audience. Um, what programs your business is running? Do you know? Um, I'm going to launch a poll now. Uh, let me know if you can see these questions. Great. Thanks, Toby. 
I don't see them. I mean, you're not really they, asking for me, but um, <laughs> I, I don't see them. I know your answer, Mark. Don't worry. Um, and these are anonymous, by the way, guys. So feel free to let rip. Sarah doesn't see it, Sam. Doesn't see the questions that is. Um, I think it might be an option in your Zoom user interface, Sarah. Cool. Yeah, we're getting some questions in now, answers in now. Also, I want to make the point that it, it doesn't necessarily need to be thought of or um, described as a change program with you know, small c, small p, all capitalized. Um, it might just be a, a looser idea, like an area of focus um, for the company over 2020 or you know for the next three years. Um, no, I, don't, I, don't, I was going to give some examples of what these might be, but then I might influence the results of your of your questions. Um, but, um, but I want to broaden it from being just a change program to you know some sort of particular specific emphasis that is company wide. Um, it may or may not be called a change program or a transformation um, priority program. Absolutely, that makes sense, Mark. Okay, so pretty much everyone's voted. So, going to end the poll very shortly. All right. Uh, very interesting. Not totally surprising, actually. So I'm sharing the results. You should be able to see them now. Uh, number one, digital transformation. Uh, I think that echoes what we hear from a lot of our clients. Um, digital transformation. Everyone's undergoing it. Everyone's still undergoing it. It's still one of the most important things. Um, next is, is leadership. Interesting. Um, often with big change comes leader, leadership development programs um, because these leaders and managers are the people helping push through the change. Um, culture and values also strong. Process improvement, ways of working. Data centricity, really not a popular one. Um, so this is how it compares with the results from our survey. You can see here quite that... Quite similar. Data centricity was bottom there as well, wasn't it? Exactly. So it's quite similar. When are we not digital transforming, says David Glow. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about this, Mark? Um, what about David's question? Um, when the are we not? I think the, um, well, I think it's a short list anyway. So I think, you know, it sounds like all of these things are important to quite a lot of companies um, uh, anyway. We, you know, from my experience, I just hear that phrase, digital transformation, um, used more than the others, so I'm not particularly surprised at that. I'm a little bit surprised about the process improvement ways of working, um, but um, that, that possibly is because I don't hear it, um, those terms used to describe it, but, um, but process improvement is, um, you know, it's pretty uh, fundamental methodologies, technologies, and what have you to make uh, the business run um, more smoothly. So um, do I, am I surprised? Well, I'm not surprised about our <laughs> results. I'd already, I'd already seen them. Um, <laughs> but I'm also interested in the data centricity i've actually been writing over the last couple of weeks an article with now josh person it'll come out <clears throat> on harvard business review next next week so you know we've, we've been talking about that quite a bit and that that way of putting it data centricity might get a 28 percent um, response rate um but if it were framed more as evidence-backed decision making which is for um the average knowledge worker actually what you know data is uh, can be harnessed for then maybe it is one sort of sounds more appealing and feels more um useful to more people um so yeah th th those are my comments yeah what that, about you sam what do you think oh uh, yeah that's data centricity thing in? the data centricity thing is definitely an interesting one for me uh, one's made the good point in the chat that is it well understood is it part of digital transformation and i think your newer moniker mark of evidence-based decision making is, is actually more important, but I think that might be an issue for the L&D industry sometimes given uh, what we, we see out there. But uh, yeah, so let's dig into it. Um, how would you go about, Mark, then trying to understand these changes um, and these change programs in a business? Um, Maybe we have well, five easy steps. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Uh, maybe we've got some slides to take us through them as well. Um, there we go. We do. Oh, you knocked that up very quickly. Okay. So, um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, look, we've, we've got a, a, a process that we follow to, um, you know, deliver, uh, to support a change program through capability lifting, um, leveraging lots of stuff, but tech and, um, and and the people that work, you know, here at Filtered, I think that a lot of what we do is common sense, and um, you know, and in some cases we're exhibiting best practice, but it will be relevant anyway, whether whether you're um, interested in, in in what we do specifically in Magpie um, or not. Uh, those five steps, as you can see now, is um, is get the right data. Um, We'll dig into each of these, get the right data, build a skills framework um, that is going to work for your company and, your, uh, and what you're trying to achieve. Find very good content, so the curation, the tagging, all of that. Um, enter the flow of work, also a, a pet thing of um, Josh Bursins and, and some other people, um, but basically getting close to where people actually are in, in companies. Um, and then find find people to um to broadcast this is this is effectively internal comms marketing sam so i'm sure you'll have a view on that as well as we get to that that one absolutely uh, many views in fact but yeah um i think let's start and dig into to the data as i think the data is always a good place to start before you do anything to get informed with it um so what kind of data um would would you suggest people look to collect if they're going to try and understand a change program or initiative in their business? Well, I, I think before there's obviously there's just so many sources of data and there's just so much, um, there is so much possibility there, but before, you know, picking out, um, data sources and data types, um, it really is, it does pay to, you know, understand the problem, understand the change that, um, so let's say it's digital transformation, um, really dig into that. So, you know, is that for everyone in the company or is it for certain um, uh, subsets of the of staff more particularly? Why is that a priority? Um, why is it a priority now? Um, and what exactly is meant by um, by that term, you know, for, for your company in your, in your industry? Um, digital transformation, um, will mean different things at different at different companies and by different people within the same company. So really digging into that will help give a clue as to what um, data sources might be um, most useful. Um, I don't have a specific example, so I will be speaking generically. Um, but uh, here's um, I mean here's, here's three sources that that will that generally are um, are useful or considered when we're talking to clients. Um, so one might be. Okay, I'm going to use, because I'm writing this article, um, data capabilities. So one source might be looking into um, the PDPs of, um, of staff. How often does this um, data capabilities of some sort, so you know, various synonyms of, um, of that or subsets of that uh, domain of expertise, how, how often does it come up? Um, another source of data might be learning management systems and the search queries that go on there. This is something that Laurie Niles Hoffman talks about quite a bit. Um, and, um, and, and although it's, you know, it's really common sense to start with pull organic pull data um, from staff over you know, potentially a number of years, it's very often not done. And when we ask clients for that data, um, two things, normally they haven't looked for it themselves, which is interesting in itself to, to me. Um, and they haven't looked at it. It's also quite difficult for them to find. So I don't think it's just um, as simple as, you know, a couple of clicks and, and getting that download, although it should be. Um, and by the way, it is with um, using Magpie, getting that sort of uh, feedback is relatively easy, but it's, it's easier for us because we've been around for less, um, for less long. So our, our tech is all more modern and, um, well, yeah, but, and, and built more recently. But at some point, it, it, there'll be someone at your learning management uh, system provider that can get that data. So get them to get them to do it. It's really, really interesting once you start aggregating and looking for patterns, um, what people have actually looked for. So I think that's a, a valid data source. And the other thing to mention is that 
you almost certainly won't have perfect data from wherever you look um, for the specific outcome that you're after. So if you're after data capabilities, something that you might be interested in is the current level of enthusiasm for developing data skills and what skills those might be. That starts to sound already a bit quite specific. So if you've got that in mind and that feels important or some sort of specific question, you're probably going to have to go and get that data from focus groups, from surveying. Um, and that's very often, not in all cases, but very often um, part of the, the first exploratory phase that you know, we undertake with clients. It's just you know, going to the front line, asking some questions and getting specific uh, data that doesn't lie somewhere this made up for um it was put together for for this specific purpose so what i'm what i'm saying really is understand the but really understand the um the problem you probably do already um uh, or the change of what support you know what, what change you're trying to affect um and then there'll be various sources that you can consider but you know what 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 people have looked for already um what's going on in their um personal development plans or you know appraisals and um and run your own survey and then synthesize all of this. I mean, so then, then I think, um, <clears throat> Sam, you're still there. I'm not talking to a voice. <laughs> no, okay. I'm just, oh, right, cool. Right, I just wanted to, no, I wanted to get that. No, that's fine. Um, and then synthesizing it. So you've got various different data sources. They need to be, um, weighted and probably cleaned and, um, and utilized for your new purpose. That's not, a really easy thing to do. I mean, even getting the data is not a really easy thing to do. So with the vendor that you're speaking to um, and the various internal stakeholders, you want to you want to be able to have an open, um, interesting, engaged conversation that is that is nuanced because you know the world is messy and um, it's not like uh, the message that comes from the data is going to be you know really obvious. Uh, there won't be a, a very obvious signal in most cases. It requires quite some synthesis and uh, conversations um, to, um, you know, to draw out the insight. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it is really about, like you say, just getting your hands dirty and get in there with the data. Um, it's not just about increasing the, the data capabilities of your team, but of yourself and, and really engaging with it. And interestingly, that you mentioned data capabilities. Um, in the chat, both Lisbeth and Mitchell have mentioned uh, digital fluency and how important it is in their business and really enabling the, the individual themselves to deal with data. And I think it is just getting that, that data literacy across your whole organization, including your learning and development team. Um, so yeah, just get in there and uh, really dig around in the data. And yeah, David's highlighting in the chat, weighted and cleaned. Yeah, raw data, you can't just chuck it at people. Uh, people can't interpret it. And data is messy. Um, it may be digital, but it's messy. Um, so as David says, it's, it's really important before you get data into a decision stream to weight it and clean it. Um, do we have any questions so far on the data? The data side of things. And yeah, Toby mentions it doesn't just have to be done in spreadsheets. Um, get on the whiteboard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we actually have had some really good whiteboard sessions here at Filtered recently. Um, so much. So we've also we've all, we've also had loads of really good spreadsheet sessions. So you know it's the synthesis <laughs> of um, both of these both of these tools. But yeah, I'd absolutely take Toby's point. It also you know gut feels, um, gut feelings. Um, should I say you know hunches from you know those that have been close to this. That 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 is data in and of itself. Um, it needs to be you know um, scrutinised, obviously. But um, but you know those those feelings that people have developed over a number of years about certain you know important issues that 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 can all be taken into you know the qual side of um of understanding the problem and 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 um, and, and amassing the right evidence. Yeah, totally, and that does come with spending more time with the data. You start to get those hunches a bit more easily. So once you've got that data, then you know you can use it to make a business case. You can use it to inform your learning strategy. You can even use it to prove ROI down the line. But more practically, Mark, like. How do we use that data uh, to really get down and target uh, the things that a change program needs to affect? Okay, so I'm going to try and make this as um, as sort of tangibly as tangible as as possible. Um, so, um, so if you just take one of those um, sources of data that I mentioned earlier, 
So it, this might not be appropriate, but um, I would say in most cases, it's one of the things you'd want to look at. So this is, you know, what, what have been the search queries over the past 18 months, two years um, on the LMS? Now, um, that will be messy data, so that definitely needs to be cleaned um, and, uh, and weighted. But it'll definitely start to give you a view as to what is most important. So if the company is saying, so let's say a CEO is saying that data capabilities is really, really important um, for reasons X, Y, and Z, and you understand that. And then you've also got some on the ground, you know, from the workforce data about what people are looking for. Bringing those two together, seeing what overlap there is, what gaps there are, is exactly the kind of um, iterative process that's going to get you to a skills framework that makes sense for your company at this point in time. Um, so, you know, on, on data, it might be checks or data visualization or labels or charts, graphs, segmentation. Um, you know, the level is important as well. You know, with data capability, is it the consumer? Do you want people to be able to consume it well or also produce it well? Um, but you can get to that detail by synthesizing, you know, company level. Um, demands and aspirations with a data source like LMS search queries and with multiple other conversations and focus groups as well. But that's what you need. You need to effectively break down that capability, data, data or digital or whatever, into its component parts using the evidence that you have. And, um, and that defines then the problem for you. If you, to use an analogy that, um, may not be helpful. Um, imagine you had to describe yourself in, in seven words. Well, um, you'd have to pick the right seven words, but you'd also need to be sure that the person you're describing this to understood what you understood by, those, by each of those seven words. So the, the two things that are important here, one is having a skills framework that, you know, a taxonomy that um, makes sense for your, for your situation. And then within each of those words, the skills that um, form part of the, the framework, that they are well defined and reasonably well understood by, um, by not just you, but by your, by your workforce. So, um, so yeah, choosing the right um, words and defining them well is really, um, really crucial. Um, it's also crucial because this is the backbone of, I mean, it happens to be the backbone of Magpie and our product, but it'll be the backbone of, um, of a lot of learning systems you know, essentially, if you're trying to if you're trying to link a person to some content in some kind of intelligent and useful and effective um, way, the conduit, the, the the common currency is skills. People can be related to skills through roles um, and activity, and content can be related to skills through um, the right sort of tagging. Tagging often is tagging is metadata, and that's often um, not clean in learning systems that we come to. But if that job is done well, and the tagging fairly represents what the content's about, you've got a chance of linking it to the skills and therefore to the person um, uh, that you're that you're you're trying to help. And so, um, so yes, yeah, uh, skills framework. It, yeah, you need to pick the right words. You need to define them, and it's really important because it is the backbone of um, of a of a learning system. Skills framework. How uh, uh, one of um, the three founders of this company, Vinit Chris Vinit, wrote a, a piece about um, transformative skills frameworks recently, which is at the back of this presentation. I it's really good, um, and I would recommend people read it. And speaking of definition, how exactly would you define a skills framework, especially in the context of change initiatives? So you've mentioned there it can kind of serve as the, the Rosetta Stone between people and behaviors or, or capabilities. Um, but, but how would you define it and how would you say that it can really help a change initiative? Um, how would I, okay, so, well, 20 words? It might just be 20 words. Um, I was going to give you seven, framework. but... You can have more. <laughs> seven would be, yeah, seven, seven might be tough. Um, but for a change, to assist a change um, program, then 10, 20, 30 words or phrases that um, are, you know, well picked because, you know, for coverage, but also they're the right words that will make sense to, you know, to, to your audience. Um, and once you've got those and they, they are well defined, then, then, you've got your, then you've got your definition. Um, so, for example, for a leadership program, what might that look like uh, in terms of the skills framework? 
Well, I reckon the people on the call will have had experience of this, but if you break down leadership for your, for your company um, and you understand the audience, then, so, you know, is it senior leadership? If it's senior leadership, then it's a, it'll be slightly, you, you'd probably be making slightly different choices for your framework. Mm. Um, it might be about sort of, um, I don't know, representing the company um, externally on big stages, on um, uh, large board representation. It might be about understanding shareholder value, whereas leadership lower down in the company might be um, you know, different, a bit more closer to um, managerial skills. So, um, so that, that's where you know, it's, it's hard for me to give um, specific examples before you know, we, you know, we've agreed what the, um, you know, the, the problem is, but it's those sorts of, it's those sorts of things. I mean, everyone will see lead, if you just Google leadership framework, you'll get a framework. Um, and that won't be, you know, some of those words will probably be useful in forming your framework, but first you've got to understand, um, the change you're, you're trying to affect and, um, and, and look at the data and get to it that way. So, cause it, cause it's just so important to get this right. Um, we're working with a client at the moment, um, and the initial project, which is two, three months, is all is it's it's purely spent on this. So basically, getting to the right skills framework and getting to the um, uh, getting ideas about the content that would go you know, be pinned uh, to it. Because um, once you get that right, then you can provide a much more specific um, and effective service plus technology. But if you just rush that and you know you've got a sort of turnkey um, platform that will you know, sit there and have and host all of the content. Um, it's a different level of um, efficacy. Well, anyway, it's not our approach. There's some really good guys out there that we like that do that, but it's not. It's not. It's not how we do it. And Pablo has put a really good definition in the chat. Um, he put the skills framework provides key information on sector, career pathways, occupations, job roles, existing and emerging skills, and a list of training programs for skills upgrading and mastery. And yeah, that's that's very good point, Pablo. You really can expand these skills frameworks to deal with a lot of different things and move into to routes like pathways and, and talent management. But as Mark said, uh, at Filter, we're really focused on the skills uh, in terms of how they deliver for a change program and then how that relates to, most importantly, the content that, that we deliver to the users to help affect those behaviors and changes. Um, on, so, on, on that, actually, I just want to pick yeah, up ahead, on, on, um, on, on Pablo's point, Sam. Um, so the occupations and, and roles and your job roles, I think that's, yeah, that, that's, that's really, so I think that the skills framework doesn't have to incorporate that, but what it does need to do, you need to have a clear way of relating that framework to the job roles in your company. So the job roles in your company and what data you have on that and the imperfections, the warts, all everything, that is part of that data work that, you know, on the, in the previous step. But if, if that's not very well developed, then it's going to be very hard to link people to, to skills. So sometimes that is the job initially. It's, you know, we need to get better data on um, the roles in order to be able to develop a skills framework that's not going to be like a, um, a theoretical work of art. It needs to be able to plug into um, roles or there needs to be a relationship that's going to work um, when you, um, uh, you know, to link them. So, so it's a really good example. Um, Pablo, thank you for raising that. Yeah, and I, I think the other side to that is that when you plug that kind of data with job roles into an algorithm, it can naturally evolve over time as people are uh, using the content and, and working through the content uh, to improve definitions of the skills, but also the, the job roles themselves. It gives you a lot clearer picture when we analyze the data through, for example, the QBRs we run with clients of, of how those skills and, and job roles actually link up within an organization. Uh, James QBRs, Burry, everyone is, is quarterly business reviews. That's the terminology. Yeah, sorry. And jargon. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. And James has put, um, it's critically important that a skills framework defines a common language within an organization. Absolutely. Um, as, as Mark alluded to, it's all about communication. Um, David's written that his is a bit more fuzzy. It's more about goals not roles. So no clear best scaffolding pathway for all. It's individualized. I think that reflects earlier comments from people saying that um, it's about enabling the individual and their data fluency. Digital fluency. It does, Sam. It also reflects actually the, the, the flexible product that, that we've built because, you know, I mean, it, when we first built Magpie, it was more sort of roles oriented. Um, so before there has been any usage, we could 
um, stand up some um, pretty useful, um, meaningful recommendations from day one because we've got linked from roles to, to skills. But as we've evolved the, the product and talked to you know, clients more and more, um, the, the aspirations and sort of longer term um, either career paths or interests of individuals become more of a thing, um, more important. So we've built that into the product that you know, if, if you want to um, ascertain what clients, uh, what individual what users are, are trying to do, what's important to them, um, even what they're anxious about, um, you can ask those questions, get that data from within the product in order to, um, to make the recommendations and build playlists, pathways and what have you. So um, ours is quite fuzzy as well. Um, David, it's uh, fuzzy, flexible, if you prefer flexible. Content. Yeah, so, so how does that skills framework translate then to delivering relevant content? Well, I've, I've alluded to, to, to it a little bit already. So the skills need to link to um, the skills framework, that taxonomy, that list of, list of words, phrases, needs to be able to link to the content that you, um, that you have. So for each piece of content, be it an infographic, a podcast, a e-learning course, a whatever it is, um, there needs to be some metadata that relates it to one or more skills in the skills framework. And very often the libraries that you've bought, the content that you've created yourselves, the um, internet has not been designed with your specific skills framework in mind. So there needs to be a job done to tag that content with, um, with your um, nicely designed skills framework. And that will, I mean, for us, that's a combination of human expert input, of mappings, um, of algorithms, um, and also of culling um, what content is just, is deemed to not be useful for the population, which can actually bring some cost savings in and of itself, but also then reduces the, um, the tagging task and, and um, uh, opens up options for more human involvement if we're talking about a few hundred um, or um, more human involvement, just a, a larger team if it's, uh, if it's a bit more than that. Um, but, but again, actually, the data is really important here because, you know, rather than just sort of jettison an entire library, you, you're going to want to look at the data sources. So what have the levels of, any, of engagement been with library X over library um, Y? Um, for which populations, over what time? Um, so this is, a, this is, again, I think that's another very useful source of data um, uh, usage and any feedback, um, whether it's anecdotal and, you know, qualitative feedback or, um, or you know, sort of big data um, uh, quantitative stuff. Um, that's, all, that's all important in, in making the right decisions about the content that you have. I just urge that the, the better use is made from, from most um, companies of, of the web. Um, there is just so much out there that is, um, well, terrible. Um, there's far more of that. But because there is just so much, um, you know, the best of it is, is really very good and, um, and may even be able to deliver um, in and of itself what you're after capability-wise. Yeah, exactly. And I think that last point's a good one, that all of this is done in the context of a skills framework that's been put together, again, in the context of a change program. So everything, all improvements and all of this content that's being recommended is working towards that, that change initiative. Uh, Mitchell's raised uh, a re another recent Burson article, uh, The War of the Skills Cloud. I think you've read that one, right, Mark? Yeah, we're featured in it. I've, I've read, um, I read, read most of um, his stuff, Josh's stuff. I think it's, you know, because he's such a good um, synthesizer of, you know, high level people in businesses around the, around the world and then you know, and, and publishes frequently, you know, he's a good person to, to follow and I'm obviously not the only person in, in reaching that, that view. Um, the, we think about this with the war for the skills cloud. Um, I'm not sure it's a war, really. I don't think, I think a skills cloud is, is an end in and of itself. Um, so I think in that article, you know, there's a few vendors that are mentioned. And like I said, we are, we are um, and others are too. And, and one of the points I made in the LinkedIn post shortly after Josh posted that, um, wrote that article was, what are you actually doing that for? What is that? Okay, so you can have a... Um, a, a crowd sourced, I say crowd sourced, crowd sourced um, 
uh, skills cloud and it builds and it builds and it's, you know, it's generated by all of these um, users. That's not really that dissimilar from the search queries in an LMS. Um, what's much more valuable is if you take that sort of data and then do something intentional and central uh, with it. So I don't think, I mean, of course, you know, it's a feature for a lot of these guys. Um, personally, I think that, that taking a more intentional approach is, um, yeah, is, is more effective. So it's an interesting article, and invite people to, to read about it. Um, but I don't think you're going to get your skill, your crowdsourced um, skills cloud. That's not going to be, that would be an input for a skills framework, your taxonomy. It wouldn't be the output. Um, which is where I think a lot of, you know, some of the other vendors are, um, are headed with it. That this is an end in and of itself. Uh -uh. Yeah, you need more than that. Uh, and as David suggests, it helps solve the Goldilocks issue um, about content. What's not too big, not too small, but just right for my next step. That's the key to relevance. But uh, speaking of Josh Burson, uh, he's famously coined the term flow of work and learning in the flow of work. Um, let's flow on to that one ourselves. Um, Beautiful what do you mean by album. flow? Of work? <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I should should be on the radio like Alan Partridge or something. Um, what do you mean by the the term flow of work? Like, how would you interpret it, Mark? What are the most important channels for it? Okay, so I, I think too much is said about flow of work. Anyway, that's a I'll just sort of lay lay that out there. Um, All right, I'll delete this slide. Sorry. And uh, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, <laughs> I think well, uh, not because it's not a relevant topic, but I just think because so much is said about it. Look, really, to me, this is about um, when you're trying to help people learn the right stuff to be better at their job and feel better about doing their job, you need to get close to where they actually are. And that'll be some things that are not learning systems because most people don't spend a lot of time in an LXP or an LMS. They will be elsewhere. They'll be in Slack, in small and medium companies, um, increasingly at larger companies, they'll be using Microsoft Teams. Um, at all companies, they'll be using email. So to me, um, flow of work is about reducing friction so you, you get to where people actually are. So you know, our priority for Magpie has for some time been focusing on those two um, channels, email and um, and Microsoft Teams. Um, and actually, I should mention, do the plug for, we're releasing a um, significant feature for Microsoft Teams, so like a really a, a deep, meaningful integration, not just, um, you know, plugging it into Microsoft Teams. Um, and, we're, and we're launching that and talking about that at Learning Tech. So if you're coming to it next week, um, we'll, we'll be there talking about that and, um, you know, and other things too. But there's a, there's a launch coming out. Um, but I think the point there is that Look, if you want to have an impact with what you're doing, it's not just important. It, you can't just um, have really good content and make all of these good decisions that we've been making previously. You've got to get in front of people. I mean, effectively, this is your internal advertising. It's marketing. Um, it's, you know, like I said at the, at the top of this, at the start of this webinar, you don't, it, people are so busy. I mean, they're unimaginably busy. Everyone is just like, it's just, everything is just constant. Um, you know, smartphones have a lot to answer for. Smartphones and emails combined and actually other comms tools like, like Slack and Teams have a lot to answer for. So that means that you need to just use every advantage you possibly, um, you possibly uh, have. And, um, and getting in front of people is, um, you know, where they are is important. There is one other thing with flow of work, which relates to sort of just in time and search and pull. There is another, I think this is a, um, it gets confused with the, in, in the whole flow of work discussion. Ideally, you've got a system which is so smart, has so much data that it anticipates your, your very thinking and thought process. Um, now that's, we're not there yet. We might not be there for another um, 50 years. But what you can do as a learning systems content assembler, a learning, an L&D practitioner, is expect that the users will have a need at a certain point and search and make your content um, and your various facilities really highly um, discoverable. And really that means very, very good indexing and tagging so that it can be pulled as and when um, 
it's needed. So um, what I'm saying is one, just reduce friction and get in front of people where they actually are. Maybe your company doesn't use email very much or, or, that, or people are bombarded and, and email just has a, a bad reputation um, uh, and has become almost unusable. That's not the case with most of the clients that we speak to. Email is still a very, you know, um, effect. the inbox is a place that is you know, just still really important. Um, and a lot has been done over the last 10, 15 years to you know, reduce spam and make um, email more, more relevant to people. Um, and Microsoft Teams is just growing faster and faster and faster. It's the thing, the second fastest after Outlook, Microsoft products, or well, it's only B2B products ever. So, <clears throat> you know, the, there are a lot of trials that are being done at the moment. There are, there are an increasing number of companies that are just using it loads. Um, so that's what I mean by flow of work. There's an article about a year ago with, um, with Josh about this and says some of what I've just, um, what I've just, uh, just said. Actually, one more, one more point on the topic that, Flow of work needs to be um, ancillary to, so no, our interjection of the flow of work needs to not just stem that flow, it needs to actually augment and, you know, uh, catalyze. So, so for example, if you actually throw up some relevant learning content right there in Microsoft Teams when someone was working on something and the content's really interesting, it could easily be a distraction. So even if you had all of the smarts to do that, it could be a distraction. But whereas having it go into someone's inbox, you know, at some point around that time, it's not a distraction because they'll go to that um, email as and when they're ready. Um, so there's quite a lot of nuance to this, um, you know, to this, uh, this concept of um, you know, learning and the flow of work, as, you know, as Josh and others put it. Um, I find it really interesting, and although I said too much has been said about it, I, I do, I love talking about it. So if anyone wants to pick up on this, I mean, or anything else that we've been talking about, I'm, I'd be very, very happy to. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Get in touch with us, guys. And uh, that's one last step to our to our five steps to aligning with your business change program. And I think it's quite an important one. Um, it's getting the right champions, finding the right people to support you, the right stakeholders. Um, how would you say you'd go about doing that, Mark? Um, I think, um, okay, well, who so are they? Th th actually? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks for, thanks for help helping me out here. <laughs> okay. So, so there are the obvious candidates that, you know, people that work with, um, you as an L and D person. So, you know, learning and development directors and HR people and, um, CHROs and CLOs and what have you. Um, those people would be highly important to a decision to buy a you know a more generalist um solution like a you know an lxp or an, or an lms too i think what's different about this approach and aligning to a you know, specific need or a specific capability change program is that one you're going to um one you're going to have um different people that care so if it's data capability and someone's, you know, some senior leader, leaders have been talking about that, then you've got a ready-made list of stakeholders and potential champions for it. So you can go straight to, um, straight to them. And that might go all the way up to the top, um, you know, the CEO. We've got another, um, it's not client yet actually, so it's a prospect that we're sort of deep in talks with. And because that um, company is focusing on digital literacy and that did literally come from the top it's a stated ambition of um you know c3 of, of, of board and of the ceo to imp improve the dig digital literacy um in assessing in assessing magpie and our, our solution it went all the way up to those guys um for consideration which doesn't always happen doesn't often happen um for most learning learning solutions but it happens because someone cares someone senior uh, really cares about this thing so I think for if you're taking this approach, it opens up the possibility of senior leaders that have a stated um, uh, ambition here. And actually, in understanding the change program in the first place, one of the questions to ask is so it's not just like why, why now. Um, I would also add to that who really is driving this, who really cares at the company. Because um, if it's a big thing that you've all heard about, it will be senior people. And it will be people. It won't just be one one person. So get those guys um, on side. And the other um, group of human beings you probably want to um, consult over the course of this. I would say that this relates to data at the start, but it's the frontline staff. This is evidence that is very often not picked up. Uh, LND people sort of 
um, in some cases, so in many cases, in, in my experience, our experience, um, sort of assume that they, they know. Um, and, and even if they do, I think it pays to get some frontline um, evidence um, to back up those claims and, and probably make them more specific. Um, so three kinds of stakeholders, the, the, you know, the usual CHRO um, types, um, the person, people in the company that really care about this change program. And if you can't find out who they are, then maybe it's not the change program that your, that your company is actually really behind. It can't really be faceless, something like that. Uh, at some point, your company is made up of individuals. Um, if that's a stated aim, it's stated by someone. So um, yeah, the people that care and then frontline the, um, the workers outside of L&D. Yeah, those town hall forums can be so important for that. And then, yeah, for the senior guys, I think it's really about finding out what their heart attacks are, as a, a dear old friend of mine likes to call it. Um, yeah, yes. cool. So that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, we, it did include one more question from the survey here, which is how do you measure the ROI of change programs? I'm not going to run another poll just for time's sake, um, but here were the results. And it is all about engagement and retention. So really enabling those individuals to succeed at their career and, and do what they want to do and stay engaged and at the company, importantly. Um, and we can, you can uh, see the full results of this survey. They'll be released very soon. Um, we'll email them out to everyone on this webinar alongside the recording of the webinar. Um, so yeah, just to sum up, I think we'll run through it very quickly. How do you align with your business's change programs? Number one, get the right data. Two, build a skills framework, find great content, uh, enter the flow of work or work adjacent, as it might be, and uh, then get the right champions and stakeholders. Um, yeah, we've got two minutes left. If there's any last quick questions, just let me know in the chat. Can you tweet this? Yes, please do, Toby. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Love you too. Um, screenshot it and tweet away. Um, yeah, we'll send it around to everyone, as I said. Um, in conclusion as well, if anyone's going to be at Learning Technologies next week, come say hi. We're at stand E15. We don't buy it. Uh, we've got a seminar on day one, uh, 12.30, I believe, this one. Uh, that'll be on a, on a similar topic. And we'll actually have AJ from Arcadis, one of our clients there, talking through how they've been, been doing something like that in their company. And if you want to get in touch with us, um, have your socks blown off by a Teams demo, visit filter.com and we'll be happy to help. And as Mark said, he's, he's put a little reading list in there for you. So you've got some homework to do. Um, feel free to screenshot this one. I'll leave it on this slide for now. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for attending. And thanks, Mark, for your time. Really enjoyed chatting Thank with you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Enjoyed it. Should cool. Do it again keep, sometime. Yeah, keep your eyes peeled for the next one. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody.